Good afternoon, everybody. And welcome to this presentation on the specification and architecture of a system factory for space systems using Capella. My name is Elena Laña. I work for GMB. And today, together with my colleague Tiago, we will show you the preliminary results of an ongoing activity that is being developed in the frame of a project for the European Space Agency. So these are the contents of the presentation. I will start with a short summary of the project context and the needs of this development. Secondly, an introduction to this activity that is called, in short, SASIF. Then Tiago will show you some results that we have for this functional architecture of the system factory. And we will finalize with some conclusions derived from, from this work. Okay, so let's start with the first point, the project context. So I would like to start this presentation explaining a bit the motivation behind this project. Um, the level of uh, complexity of space systems is increasing more and more, and also the level of autonomy. So new, new approaches are needed. So we will like to enable the deployment of model-based system engineering in a space project. The idea is to, to replace current document-centric approach with models. And this is sustained by, by modeling languages, tools, uh, processes, and so on. And um, we believe that this will bring on some benefits. For instance, it will improve the productivity or the efficiency, thanks, for example, to the automation. But it's also clear that the different stakeholders that are involved in, in the development of a space system will need to exchange models among them. So we need to ensure interoperability with the model-based system engineering community. And this is not an easy task. It's not easy because on the one hand, the different stakeholders may use uh, different, different tools, even different modeling languages. And on the other hand, because we have to, to guarantee that everybody has the same understanding on the information exchange. And so concerning the first point, the tooling, we will need to define a common infrastructure that will enable us to exercise this new paradigm. And this is called the, the system factory. So if we take a, a look to this uh, system factory, um, the system factory represents the reference system engineering modeling infrastructure for developing space systems. This is a key element to deploy model-based engineering and will enable us to exchange engineering data amongst organizations. It's clear that this is not the only thing that is needed, but it's one of the key elements. And we are assuming that it will implement a data hub. The data hub will be the place where the different models and data is exchanged, for example, with other uh, actors or other entities, such as the avionics factory, software factory, and so on. And one of well, one issue that is really important is to consider that this architecture shall be agreed by the community. I mean, um, finally, uh, different organizations, partners, people with different roles will have to use this, this infrastructure. So we have to be able to capture the different needs and to derive this architecture. It's a, like a kind of standardization. This is not easy. And for this, we have this project that is the specification and architecture of a system factory, SASIF. So let's take a look a bit to what we are currently doing in SASIF activity. Well, the, the objective is the specification and architecture of a model-based system engineering infrastructure for a space system engineering. This activity is a, an activity for the European Space Agency. It's led by GMV. And we are doing it in collaboration with the three large system integrators, Airbus, Thales Alenia Space, and OHV. Also, PRFC is collaborating with us. Pascal is giving us advices, especially concerning the correct usage of Capella and the Arcadia methodology. The project started in January this year, 
and we foresee that we will have the final results around July or August next year. So we are currently halfway, but we have already some, some results, some preliminary results that we would like to share with all of you. So going back to, to the objective, it's clear what has to be done. Now the thing is how we are going to do that, how we are, we are going to develop this infrastructure. For this, we will use Capella Toolchain, also taking advantage of the Arcadia methodology that is behind. And as I said before, it's very important to capture all the user needs. So for this, we are working together with Thales, Airbus, and OHP because we need to, to identify, based on their expertise and knowledge, we need to capture the different needs and derive this architecture. So this is an iterative and, and work that we are doing all together. Additionally, the results are being reviewed by the Model Base for System Engineering uh, Group. This is an ISA group that includes also members from national agencies, industry, and space organizations. So that's really nice because many people is going to review the results of this activity and we can refine the, these results. Okay, so concerning the, the Capella usage, one of, of the key issues here is that we are not using Capella to develop a concrete system, a real system, but to develop a reference system. So the architecture of this infrastructure that will later allow us to develop the space systems. So that's a bit different to what is currently done in traditional projects. And for this, we are using the version 1.4.0. That was the, the latest one that was available when the project started. Additionally, we are using two add-ons, the XHTML documentation generation to produce documentation from the Capella model and the requirements viewpoint to define requirements directly in the Capella model. We are not using any external tool. Well, uh, one thing I wanted to highlight here is that we are requested to produce two different outputs. On the one hand, uh, typical deliverables in Word and PDF with the justification and the rationales behind the, the architecture that we are going to model. And on the other hand, the Capella, Capella model itself and the documentation produced automatically from the model, the HTML files, and the Excel from the mass visualization tables. But uh, we will, although this is not an objective of, of the project, we will also try to, to identify if we are able to include all the information and all the in justifications in the Capella model. That would be really nice because this way, the model is the, the single source of information. So we will also produce the documentation from the model because finally, maybe, someone uh, has not uh, Capella installs and wants to see the architecture. So this is needed, but not any parallel documentation apart from the model. So uh, at the end of the activity, we will take a look at all the information that we have defined in the model and see if it's feasible, if not, or any conclusions that we can derive from this modeling. And concerning the work logic. Okay, we're following the traditional process that Arcaria proposes. Currently, we have already finished the operational analysis and the system needs analysis. So we have defined all the user needs and also the, the requirements and the scope of the system factor. In the coming days, we will start the logical architecture. This is a very important point in, in our project because it will represent the logical solution. It will be a single architecture, stable in time and technology independent. And later we will derive potential physical architect sorry potential physical architectures and uh, the end product breakdown structure. So some things that I would like to remark here is that now that we have uh, the scope of the system factory uh, defined, the system factory represents the infrastructure within a company. So that's important. So all the exchanges with external stakeholders, customers, contractors, suppliers are represented as exchanges with external actors or entities. Um, concerning the physical architecture, 
we will identify the different physical elements that are envisaged to be used by the by the LSI's organizations. So we potentially can have different physical architectures that are compliant with a logical architecture. And we will also identify the tools that are currently available and tools that are needed to, to fulfill these architectures. This will be part of the gap of analysis. So um, this is the, the current status. I hope you, you have clear a bit what we are doing in this activity. And now Tiago will show you how we are materializing this in, in Capella. So Tiago, I, I stop and I let you continue. Okay, thank you, Elena. I think you can hear me. Thanks, you can hear me, Elena? Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks for the introduction. I will now share uh, this presentation as well from the same point, just in going full screen. Great. All right. So uh, as Elena said, now I will show you more a bit uh, in detail our approach in the modeling. Um, so first, uh, tell you a bit about uh, the, the initial challenges we, we face in terms of the scope of the of the system to, to model, to target. Um, as well on the different roles, uh, because as you see, system engineering is a broad, uh, a broad area. So we had to follow some, uh, to take some decisions beforehand. Uh, also, because of the consortium we uh, that uh, was made up for the activity, uh, comprising several companies, this was uh, important, and also on the tool. So uh, after this approach, I tell, uh, we'll show you a bit uh, our the current uh, Arcadia levels in Capella that we have modeled, the operational and the system uh, level. So the operational, as you uh, probably are familiar, we uh, model there all the requirements, the, the roles and the, and the capabilities uh, that we target. Um, I'll show you as well some metrics that we are currently uh, currently have. Uh, this is, uh, of course, uh, still ongoing, all the modeling. But uh, we use already these metrics uh, along the way to help us uh, uh, tailor. And then on the system part, then uh, as you know, uh, we we find this in, in system functions, their allocation, the data flow. So we go a bit more in detail on the, how things uh, look like, and uh, concluding with some challenges that uh, we are working on. Okay, so as Elena mentioned, we we. Uh, Started by uh, coming together and uh, documenting uh, in um, a reference document all the guidelines and the configuration for the tool, uh, as well some cl clarifications on the method, on the different levels, uh, so that everyone could uh, have uh, a common starting point, let's say. And this is still, uh, it's not, a, let's say, a closed document. We keep the idea is to keep looking back at it. So uh, uh, when there are some questions relating to what should we model at uh, each part and uh, how to use better the tool and to leverage, because as you know, it's a powerful tool that we have uh, to um, uh, configure it to our specific needs. So it's flexible as well for this. So it's important to come together in the beginning. So just to mention a few points we include in this document, we introduced the Arcade method uh, specify the Cap Capella setup, so version, the add-ons that we use, the configuration control uh, method, in this case, we're using Capella for Git, uh, some guidelines and tips uh, in the design itself. Um, an example uh, of a simple model, so that uh, our um, partners working with us, with contractors, in this case, the, uh, the big uh, companies, uh, Thales, Airbus, and OHB, can look into these examples too. Uh, the, uh, the, since they are using the tool themselves also, it's important we show we use the same configuration for the tooling, so we share with them a com com uh, Capella configuration file. Uh, and again, all types of uh, recommendations on what we will model at each level, what are the recommended diagrams, uh, from the which set of different representations, which are the ones we uh, uh, recommend for the, or this particular activity, etc. So, again, to conclude, to make sure we start from the common uh, point. Uh, 
Another important uh, aspect uh, before the starting of the modeling, uh, we realized indeed that uh, this is a, a, big, a, great, a big challenge to model, um, let's say, a system uh, engineering uh, framework. So that will support the design of the space systems. Uh, because, as you know, system engineering and uh, uh, encompasses several different activities, uh, different phases, uh, etc. So it was the scope was indeed huge. So it was in, it would be important to agree on the level of details, uh, areas not covered, uh, etc. So there was a risk here to uh, let's say uh, um, uh, lose focus. So we. We try to mitigate this also by having uh, often uh, meeting together. So having an uh, early and continuous feedback by uh, intermediate deliveries, uh, reviews, uh, reviewing the use cases in the progress meetings that we have several, even uh, setting up spontaneous uh, co-engineering between, uh, between the different companies. So we can look into the model or uh, try to clarify a particular aspect. Okay, so on the scope, just to not delay further and to show you some models. Um, uh, again, this uh, targets a framework for the development of space systems uh, to promote interoperability. We had to uh, target to cover all the phases, but we came together and discussed which particular tasks from the system engineering design we wanted to target. So we agreed on these tasks or activities. Also, we set we uh, we came together to list uh, nine use cases, uh, requirements engineering, uh, the space systems, the analysis, the design and configuration, verification, management and planning, interface control, design files, production, risk management, uh, support to configuration control, change man management and non-conformance control. So as you see, we try to really uh, set up a broad, uh, um, ambitious uh, uh, scope here but still uh, try to define it as, be as best as we can. And also, of course, uh, agree on the, on the system engineering rules uh, uh, that would use this system, uh, so they are, would be the ultimate users. Okay, starting with operational analysis, as you know, here at this level, we uh, start thinking about the requirements, the capabilities, the high-level roles and user needs. So we uh, model um, these uh, this important elements. Uh, of course, we try, uh, even if the beginning, we start with some documentation, as I showed you with the approach and all the inputs. It was important to um, uh, make the shift to the model. So even the requirements originally uh, in text, we uh, model them uh, in Capella. Uh, and we use different views for this, and we follow this approach throughout the model. We have both the specific views for particular, in this case, for each use case, as you see, we have here a table of requirements for each of them, but also a general one, so uh, that uh, anyone can go there on the global table and uh, have the full list of uh, requirements in this case. I here give focus to requirements engineering, that will be the, um, uh, the, the diagrams I will show will focus on this one. For instance, the customer shall uh, deliver a uh, specification to the to the supplier, and, um, and uh, it shall be possible, for instance, to uh, receive the comments related answers to that specifications, etc. Just as an example, this uh, allows, by the way, to link uh, this. Uh, Capel allows us to trace all these requirements to the models to generate uh, from these uh, some tables. Uh, with traceability, et cetera. So uh, at operational level, we focus again on the capabilities. So the, um, the high-level services or uh, let's say objectives that the si system, in this case a framework, shall uh, uh, satisfy for us or shall uh, uh, allow us to achieve. Uh, and these capabilities uh, map directly to the use cases uh, and to the requirements uh, we saw before. In this case, for instance, requirement engineering, we further break them down uh, into nine uh, into nine sub capabilities. In this case, custom requirements analysis, technical specification, the traceability, the tailoring of the requirements, etc. So again, as you see, we try to cover a large of uh, uh, themes. 
as you see, the capabilities are linked together. They are linked with the requirements as well. And now, uh, also at the operational level, we had to come up with a common uh, agreed list of roles, uh, system engineering roles. And uh, originally, we had, uh, let's say, too many. Uh, not They are not necessary, but let's say too many to uh, easy uh, the modeling task. So for uh, that reason, uh, we have this, uh, what we did was we discussed together again, and we iterated on our uh, specific definitions for each role, and then uh, we came up with this good idea uh, in our view. It's helping a lot the modeling to try to come to do some abstractions. So we do some abstraction. We have a list of specific roles in a very detailed, and then we have a list of abstract goals that are simplification, uh, reform, to uh, group uh, so the different actors into more generic ones. And of course, uh, to be uh, consistent or uh, correct me in this, we uh, do a traceability from the specific ones to the abstract ones. Uh, just an example, for instance, specific roles, we have different groups, in this case, in system engineering, uh, you have the program manager, the mission analyst, analyst ground operators, operational engineer, solution engineer, also in the product assurance branch, you will have the manager there or the RAMS engineer, down to more technical or the, the, the targeting the, diff, the various um, space engineering disciplines like the onboard software, AUCS engineer, etc. And there were many uh, indeed. So uh, what we did when we start modeling was uh, to try to use the abstraction then, so the abstract roles. So we have uh, in this way a more short set of rules that are more flexible to use. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, uh, engineer, just an example, if you, the software engineer, uh, would um, use the system in various, in various ways. So we, we would be related with participating in different uh, uh, functions and operations. But as well, uh, a UCS engineer could uh, perfectly uh, need the, to uh, execute the same uh, operations or have the same needs. So it wouldn't help the modeling when uh, we have already a big, uh, um, a big uh, infrastructure to repeat this, uh, this uh, relations and this information. So this is where the abstract rules here uh, help. So instead of having the onboard software, et cetera, uh, all the other the electrical uh, power engineers, we will just say, okay, we have design engineers and the architects, and then we map uh, to the various ones. Okay, so we have the traceability, as I, I mentioned, in one way and the other. As you know, uh, we didn't, uh, of course, model all the representations the catalog allows. We uh, agreed, as I told, in a common, uh, set of diagrams. Uh, in this case, uh, um, here we relate uh, each capability with the requirements, with the entities, sorry, the actors. It was important for communication purpose to have sequence diagrams, or in this case, the uh, entity scenarios. Uh, we found it to be very useful to communicate uh, what actually uh, or what actually the exchanges, uh, because uh, as you know, as an interoperability infrastructure, the focus is, has to be put on exchanges. So here uh, we found that the scenarios were very useful to represent what are the exchanges and the order of the exchanges uh, um, for each uh, capability in this case. Here we see, for instance, the requirements traceability. Uh, exchanges require, uh, related to requirement traceability. Of course, this then will map, as I'll show you quickly, to the data flow at system level. Uh, here we, see, we have another uh, parallel uh, representation that uh, shows us not only these, uh, these interactions, to be more precise at operation level, we uh, speak about interactions, but also the operational activities. Uh, so here uh, we have a more refined um, a a listing, uh, an organization of operational activities, operational needs, allocated to the different roles identified. And of course, this will trace uh, up to the capabilities. We see here, for instance, that these requirements traceability, uh, these exchanges go through the justify the solution um, activity. Here we use the verbs for the solutions, 
lowercase for uh, interactions and other types of guidelines, uh, uh, let's say, that help the modeling. The models become more easily um, understood. Just some metrics uh, for you to see. We uh, actually admit went a bit uh, already too far in the detail at operational level. We are learning as uh, we go to uh, to do, um, make the model, uh, let's say, uh, simple but still complete as possible. Just, just out of curiosity, if we have an idea of the, you know, the size of the model we are handling, uh, already at operational level, uh, we have uh, around 60, um, uh, 56 uh, capabilities. And of course, this will uh, refine down to uh, already uh, hundreds of activities and interactions. And of course, the, re uh, the representation is uh, another important aspect. So we should uh, control the model complexity in terms of uh, model elements, but also on the representation we choose, uh, the views we provide, which is very important to um, uh, communicate. So be able to, the views are useful to communicate uh, uh, the, sp the specificity of, uh, for instance, a specific exchange or data flow. Uh, but you also have uh, want at the same time global uh, views on uh, where all the information is there and you can eventually zoom in, et cetera. So Capella provides this uh, flexibility, which is very, very useful. So at system breakdown, I should hurry up a bit um, uh, quickly. Uh, at this level, as you know, um, we transition to system functions. Here we start to speak about the system. We try to... Uh, we start discovering what is the scope of the system, and we do this uh, we do this by uh, doing a breakdown first of the functions uh, in function that will be um, satisfied by the system and the others uh, that will not. And uh, doing this breakdown and the allocation uh, to the to the actors and the entities, um, we get we arrive in the end to. Uh, um, we know we define, let's say, the uh, external interface uh, of our system. So this uh, this interface of the system starts to uh, uh, unveil itself, so and starts to be clear, and we can actually have uh, more objective discussions on uh, on the system that is um, materializing, let's say, by looking at this uh, boundary, at these interfaces, and how we are allocating each uh, function. Here again, I uh, show you how the, the particular exchange, as an example that I give for requirements traceability, uh, can be traced in all types of representations. So here we see it in the uh, system architecture blank diagram. At system level, uh, of course, the metrics will grow further. Uh, in theory, as you go down, of course, there are some refinements. So um, this, the number of elements will grow as well. Here already around 400 uh, system functions, for example. And the representations. This, of course, means there's a big effort on the maintaining of the model, but uh, of course, this is mainly due to the huge um, the scope, uh, the ambitious scope for this framework that we target. There are some challenges to conclude quickly, uh, of course, uh, due to the communication and the uh, the type of inputs and the method to follow, as I said in the beginning, but this is why with the initial document um, was done and uh, was written and we keep looking at it, so it helps a lot. And uh, we found that uh, the model, we are uh, experiencing more and more that the modeling itself and the model itself uh, pays, uh, helps a long way on this too, because uh, we slowly start using the same uh, language, uh, in this case, the, uh, um, the terms of the Capella tool. Uh, so this helps, of course, in the communication. It's another vehicle we have to explain in more objective terms what we mean. Um, so when we say operational activity, we know we are speaking about the func uh, system function. We know the semantics behind that, so which helps to have a, a, a modeling language uh, here. To support us. Um, from this, uh, I could also uh, pinpoint, for instance, the, uh, there's also some, um, it's not easy, let's say, challenging when we go from one capella level to the other. This is normal because there's some abstraction exercise to be done, um, but which is necessary. So we found this uh, 
we had, what we were expecting already to have some discussions and some doubts when going from one level to the other. But again, um, doing uh, 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 our meetings internally and discussing together, we uh, try to uh, more and more make uh, more clear what should be in each level. Of course, with the freedom to always come back and we find things. Okay, uh, the last point, um, don't forget to have some strategy for your modeling, the number of elements and diagrams that will suit your needs and your project, and uh, be sure to, uh, to let's say, have uh, this management strategy of the modeling and the diagrams itself is also very important uh, apart from the uh, uh, from the system uh, the end of product let's say okay okay thank you boss for this really clear presentation um we have yes a bit of time for, for questions uh we have a question about the Capella configuration and guidelines for Arcadia method document. Uh, will it be available for the public? Well, currently it's, it's not available. Uh, firstly, because we are we are refining it along the the development of the architecture. Uh, currently, it's quite detailed for the for the operation analysis assistance analysis, but we foresee to extend it with some more recommendations for, for the logical and physical architectures. Uh, then uh, this is a project for the European Space Agency. So I don't know how, if ESA will decide to, to make it public or, or not. Currently it's not, uh, but I don't know what happened in, in the future. Okay. Um, next question. Uh, you were speaking about the possibility to modelize several different physical architectures. Uh, would you need several models for this? Yes, well, in fact, uh, what uh, we are requesting is to, to produce a single logical architecture. That's clear that we are going to do that. Later, uh, we may derive one single physical architecture or probably more than one. Yes, in, in that case, I'm afraid that we will need uh, several several models. It's a good question. Eh? <laughs> I agree, uh, probably we will need that. Yeah, so it's not a, a big issue for, for our case because, okay, we can see finally how it can be materialized. But it's true that it could be it would be nice to, to be able to do it in a single in a single model. Yes. Maybe the, also the version control system, Git, in this case, we are using can help with that. We will look into, into that. Thanks. Uh, okay, next question. Actually, it's three questions in one. So I will try to, to start with the first part. Uh, you mentioned that you plan to put requirements into the model. How do you plan to manage configuration control and version control? Well, uh, okay. What we are, what we have currently included in the model is, uh, for the operational analysis, we have included the the user needs, uh, but we have materialized them as requirements, the the user requirements. So, um, taking into account the current nature of the project and also the the duration is not similar to an operational project, so we foresee that these user requirements are not going to to be modified a lot. So more or less, they are consolidated right now. So that's the reason of not using an external tool with configuration control and so on, because finally, this is not, we don't want to, to spend the efforts currently on this. So our main effort is on, on the modeling part, not in the in modeling the, the requirements. So for us, this is this is enough. But it's true that in case of of uh, of uh, using it and of uh, of extend or in case that these uh, these uh, requirements uh, evolve along along the project, uh, it's true that uh, we may need this configuration control version. Yeah. Okay. And next part of this question: uh, You plan to use the model as a single source of data? How do you plan to capture all other data? 
for example, design decision, validation evidence, and so on? Well, uh, that's a good question. And we are also learning at the, at the same time that we are modeling. Up to now, we have been able to model everything in the model, but that's also because we have modeling only the operational analysis and the system is analysis. Let's see what happened now, because now in the, the logical architecture is mainly what we have to, to make some compromises, trade-offs, justify the decisions and so on. So that's not going to be trivial. Probably some parts can be included in the model. I don't know exactly the way, probably with some notes or not, but we don't want to pollute the document, the model itself. So we have as, as background also our documents to document everything and justify all the decisions that we are making, but we will try to include it there. Uh, let's see. We don't know uh, when we have the logical and the physical architectures available. Let's see if it has been possible or not. I think okay. that's our, our approach, <laughs> more or less. Yes, and, and I saw from the chat that there is no objection from me either to share about the, the guideline documents when that's it will really be great. finished. <laughs> yeah. uh, OK, and probably the last question. But I have to say that three questions in one is, is cheating in a sense. So so please to, to split your question when you have several one. Uh, so last question, have you defined your success criteria to measure the benefits through this activity? <laughs> well, in my view, my, my success with AI will be that this infrastructure will be really useful, that will be later standardized and finally used in, in real projects. As I said during the presentation, this is not the only thing that is needed. It has to be complemented with other projects that, that has the European Space Agency currently ongoing. But it would be really good. That is the first stone to be able to to apply model-based engineering in the space projects. Okay, thanks. And yes, well, it's time for a, a short and easy question. Uh, is the traceability matrix auto-generated by the capital add-on? Um, probably it refers to the to the to the visualization views, I think. Uh, maybe. Not sure. As far as I as I know, uh, yes, the, there is a future to uh, select um, the elements that we want to trace. Just that to, there is some still some manual work to configure which is actually properties of these elements are shown or not. And um, I think this is the answer. I understand the question. So yes, I assume there's just yeah. a bit of configuration to do to exactly. produce what you produce. Okay, so thanks for uh, all this information. We unfortunately are, are out of time. So I will uh, go to the next room. Thanks again for your time and for sharing with us. And see you soon. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity.